and add them to your tasks, to your project in general. My name is Amanda Kuhlman. I am the instructor for today. I am the operations manager here at Intigent. I have been here for almost seven years now. And I have a couple of certifications, one in managing projects and portfolios with Microsoft PPM in Project 2013 and 2016 and managing SharePoint 2016. And I am a big, heavy user of Microsoft Project. Uh, I also use Project Online uh, a lot in our, uh, our own day-to-day -day project management. And I am a big project user. So I probably encountered a lot of the same pain points that you may be experiencing, had a lot of the same questions that you had. So hopefully today I can help you uh, get some of those answers. So today in our resource planning, it is part of a webinar series that we are providing. It is a project essential. So it will teach you the basics of getting your schedule developed, defined, resources assigned, all the way through project execution and reporting. So today our focus is resource planning. We have had three web webinars previously. We had one that focused on getting started Microsoft Project. It focused on the different views that you can navigate through, the pros and cons of each of the different ones, and defining the project, your project calendar, your, setting your start date. And then we looked at task planning. It was broken into two different webinars because there is so, so much that you can do with task planning and so much that you need to know as a background that we split it into two different webinars. We had part one and then part two. And then today we're going to look at resource planning. We have four webinars after this one. And I have a slide at the end that has uh, upcoming webinars and it'll let you know exactly when that is. If you would like to watch one of our previous webinars or, or sign up for one of the ones coming up, all of that is on our website. Um, the webinars are recorded there and posted there. They're free, so feel free to go take a look and let me know if you have any questions as you go through. So our agenda for today is we are gonna start with about Intigent, about who we are and what we do. And then we're going to jump straight into our resource planning. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a recap about what was covered on our last webinar, just a couple of minutes to make sure that you know, everybody's up to date, make sure we're on the same page. And then we're gonna look at resource planning. And today we're gonna cover our resource types, talk about max units and why they are important, talk about pay rates, and then resource calendars. So Intigent, who are we? Uh, we provide expert services for Microsoft Project, Project Server, Project Online. That's our bread and butter. That is our primary focus. We are expanding into SharePoint and Dynamics as well. Uh, we so far have implemented, trained, deployed, migrated, help people build out the PMO with their processes. Anything that has to do with a project management process or your job as a project manager, we can help you with, and we've done it before. Uh, we, we, we help people build out a PMO, build out their, their uh, project management processes, and then we can map your process with any of the tools that, that are available with Project Server, Project Online, or Microsoft Project itself. We are Microsoft Gold Partner certified in my, uh, project and portfolio management. This means that Microsoft has recognized our organization for this service, and several of our instructors have taken certifications to bump us up to that level, which is the high level, highest level that Microsoft provides for their partners. We also are a member of the Project Management Institute, and a lot of our courses provide PDUs for anybody who attends them. So we're going to look at what we had done previously, a recap of, of what we talked about last time, which was the second part of our task planning um, series section. So during the last webinar, we talked about dependencies and why we need them. We talked about leads and lags, and then we talked about constraints and deadlines, which are actually two very different things. So this is just a quick visual about the process that we recommend that you go through when you are doing your task planning. The very first thing you should do is enter your tasks. There are summary tasks, subtasks, and milestones. How to put that together into a schedule that makes sense. How to break it out and just put in your tasks 
Uh, we talked a little bit about what to do if you have a, a set schedule, you know what's going to happen from top to bottom, and what to do if you're just handed a list of just random scattered tasks and how to organize those in a way that makes sense to both you and to anybody else who's going to be coming into your schedule. Then we talked about estimating work and duration and the difference between those two. Um, both entering tasks and estimating work and duration were covered in task planning part one. And then in part two, we covered task dependencies, the relationships between your tasks, and then constraints and deadlines. So dependencies are required to make your schedule dynamic. They are what give you the most out of Microsoft Project's very powerful scheduling engine. Without creating those connections between your tasks, you're not really letting Microsoft Project do its job. I mean, in a sense, it can be an Excel spreadsheet if you don't have those connections in place. Uh, all tasks are scheduled to begin as soon as default, uh, possible by default. And there are four different kinds of dependencies. Um, the most frequent and the default is that finish to start relationship. It, it means that the second task is can start only when that first one begins. It is dependent on it. We talked about predecessor and successor relationships. The predecessor is the task that precedes another, and the successor is the one that follows it or depends on the predecessor. We talked about lags and leads. A little bit of an extension of dependencies between the tasks. It allows you to create either extra time between the tasks that are uh, have a relationship or a dependency or a lead, which is an overlap between the two. You can identify your lags and leads in your task information dialog box. Uh, it has to do with the predecessor. There is a column for lag there. Enter a positive number for a lag or to add time onto your schedule and enter a negative number to overlap, to give a lead or to take days away from your schedule. You can see in our example here, the lag between our top task and our second task, the install project server and configure, configure project server is a lag of three days. You see that nine FS plus three days, the three days is the lag that's been built into the schedule. Task, the second task can start three days after the first task is finished. And then on the other side, you have the lead. That is noted in our example here by having configure project server environment and configure the reports. You can see that there is a lead there uh, of 8FS for finish to start minus two days. So it means it can start two days before the task before it has finished. Talked about constraints in your schedule that Avoiding constraint, the, um, the must kind of restraints, anything that require a date, the must start on, must finished on, about avoiding those in your schedule. Um, but a, con a constraint by itself is a restriction or limitation that you have put on your schedule, on the scheduling of a task. Microsoft Project has certain ways that they handle those constraints. And uh, most of the time, in the, in the default constraint is as late as possible, as soon as possible. And as late as possible is fine too, but as soon as possible allows it the most flexibility. It's going to schedule everything as soon as it possibly can. There are many, many kinds of restraints, and most of most of the other ones, the more rigid ones, do require you to have put some kind of date in there. And we recommend that, especially to start, that you do not type in start and finish dates. You do not put those must constraints on your task as this creates a very rigid schedule, a very inflexible schedule. Um, those kind of constraints put a stake in the ground for the project scheduling engine, and it will skip right over it. We did some examples of a constraint in the middle of our schedule, and we made a change to one of the tasks above it, and we looked at what would happen to the rest of your schedule if you had done that. We looked at deadlines and about how they are different from constraints. A deadline is a target date indicating when you or your manager or whoever would like a task or a milestone to be completed. This is, does not affect the scheduling engine. This is simply something you can place in your schedule to show you that, but it does not stop the scheduling engine from happening. 
you can put deadlines. We recommend doing it on milestones in your schedule. That way, you know, my milestone is expected to be completed on Friday. That's what the schedule tells me. I would really like it to be done by next Wednesday. So you put a deadline in of next Wednesday. You give yourself a couple of days because things happen. And if, you, if your milestone goes past next Wednesday, Wednesday in your schedule, then it will alert you. It will give you an indicator. You can see that, that uh, red diamond with an exclamation point, and it'll alert you it's gone past a deadline. But what it won't do is affect the scheduling engine that's already in place. Your schedule will still go on as it had before. So here is the project schedule that we reviewed during our webinar last time that we built. We added in our dependencies, which you can see in the predecessor column here. I'm going to add in our successor column. Both of these are very important. The predecessor is what comes first. And then the successor is what comes next. It's the one that has something it depends on. So you can see listed here is the task ID that relates to each one. In a drop down, you can choose to change it. You can keep it the same. But this is where you can in your schedule. A lag or a lead in your schedule can be noted by having looking in the predecessor column, and there's this lag column right here. And you can add in a positive for a, la uh, a lag. A delay in your schedule adds days on, or you can add a negative as for an overlap or removing schedule um, time from your schedule. We looked at the constraints. Let's go ahead and cancel from here. We're going to add in our constraint here. Constraint. We're going to add in constraint type. And so here is where you can see that all of my tasks are, are have a constraint of as soon as possible. Um, it's a default constraint, not really a constraint at all, because it's not stopping my scheduling engine from doing what it's intended to do. And if I do make a change to one of these, or I say I want to type in the date, I, uh, this one can't start any earlier than the, the 20th. I move the task, keep the links. Anything that I make to these changes up here will not be reflected um, in my schedule below. Everything after this line is going to be dependent on this task right here changing. We looked at deadlines as well. Go ahead and hide these columns here. We're going to add in our deadlines column. And you can see for NA, that means that a deadline has not been defined for that task. Um, but for my milestones here, I did go ahead and define them. I gave myself a couple of days in between. And then over here in the Gantt chart, you can see a green uh, arrow that's facing down. That is an indicator for my deadline. Now, my very last task here, I get my, my uh, alert. It says this task goes past its deadline. So it's a very easy way for you to see when those have happened, like I said, without changing the scheduling, because it did let the task move back. So now we're going to look at adding resources to our schedule. Um, if you don't have them defined or you don't exactly know who that's going to be, that's OK. Um, but I'm going to show you how to do it, talk about the different types and some of the pieces of information that you can capture about your resources and important to log in. But first, we're going to look at resource types. There are three types of resources that Microsoft Project can manage. There is the work resource, which are the people and equipment that complete the task. These are the resources that have work assigned to them. They actually are going to complete eight hours of work or 10 hours of work. And then you have your cost resources. These represent some kind of cost that does not have any work associated with it. Uh, travel is a good example of cost because you can have a cost that you want to capture, but you, it doesn't have any work. You can just assign it to the task, capture the costs right there. And then you have material resources, and these are consumables as the, as the project executes. Um, reams of paper, pounds of concrete, those are kind of material resources that you can put in. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to add those and about how to use those as we progress here. So understanding the resource management capabilities in Microsoft Project and doing effective resource management is one of the most significant advantages of using Microsoft Project over other task-focused scheduling tools. There are so many out there now. Why use Project? Resource management is absolutely one of those for sure. Our next webinar is about assignment planning, and it looks at the resources that you have added to your schedule, and it adds them to tasks. And we do a lot of 
what if scenarios? What if I need to add two resources to this task? What happens to the task? What if I need to take somebody away? And so we do a lot of playing around with that too. So highly encourage you to uh, log in next week as well and join us for that webinar. So for your resources, as we mentioned, there is your work and then there is your material and then there are your costs. So here is a, a, a real visual way for you to see how resources can be built into your schedule and kind of how they all will relate to each other. So you have your work resources, which are people and equipment. And then under that, you have your people, which can have a generic resource or you can have a human resource. Generic resources are placeholders. They are roles or teams or departments or something along those lines. It gives you a way to still put somebody on that task um, for that day, but you might not know exactly who that person is until your project progresses a little bit more or you're able to secure somebody to officially be on your schedule on your project. Um, so the generic um, in our schedule here, we'll look at two generics of project manager and developer, I believe. And then you have your human resources, the, the people that you know. You know they're going to be on your project, so you can go ahead and add them to your resource sheet, have them on your team, and then you can assign them to task. You know who that person is. And you have your material, which, as I mentioned, are the cost per use um, kind of, of resources, your reams of paper, for example. And then you have your cost, which is anything, is a, which a resource that does not have work associated with it and doesn't do any actual work for your project, but there is a cost associated with it that you do need to track in your schedule. So when we're looking at work resources specifically, the people and equipment that are on your project, project really focuses on what is the availability of my resources? What is their max units to work on my project? And second, what is the cost associated with it, with having that resource do it? Um, you can assign a, a standard rate. You can assign an overtime rate. You can assign a cost per use. If, every, if you use somebody from um, a, a, another consulting company and every time you do that, there is a $100 charge that's a cost per use and you can build that into your schedule as well. When naming your resources, there are a couple of best practices to consider. Uh, once you can see here, um, work, here are some examples here. So you have your human resource, you know who it is. So go ahead and put in their exact name. In our examples here, you see there's Greg Norman and Sue Connolly. Those are excellent examples of how you can do this. Um, it seems a little silly, but in the past, I have seen people use their project schedules where either they assume that they're the only ones who are going to be using it, or they assume that somebody else has their own, everybody understands what they're talking about, but I have seen schedules that have resources such as A or G or W who refer to people's names, but anybody who does not know who A or G is referring to is going to look at your schedule and not understand who those people are. So even if it seems silly, it's a one-time adding to your team, so it definitely be as precise as you can because um, you never know when you're, you might need to share your schedule with somebody else. A work resource can also be identified by a job role or a title. Um, this is where we were talking about those generic resources. Our examples here are architect, project manager, programmer, analyst, developer, designer, anything that fits your organization's business and fields can be added in here. Um, if you decide later that you do know who that person is, then you can always replace them in your schedule, and I'll show you how to do that today. Another way you can enter work resources is by people with a common skill. It's similar to title or role, um, a little bit more broad, is you can have something like testers uh, be added to your schedule. It may be one person, it may be a couple of people to talk about how to update those max units if you do have multiple people that fill a, a resource role. And then the last one there is equipment, something that you might need to schedule, a cement mixer, uh, if it's gonna run for 24 hours a day, but you still wanna make sure that that is in your project schedule, then here, you can list it here as being a work resource. So to enter in your resource information, um, by default, your resource sheets are blank, um, but we'll go into the resource sheet view. 
is a task sheet view, just data entry basically, and you can type in the resources there. Uh, there are a couple of different tables you can apply to it to see different information. The one you see here is the entry, and it shows you the high level information about your resources. You can see here it has resource name, what type it is, which would be the work, cost, or material. Um, then you have your material label, your initials, max unit, standard rate over time, and all those other data points that you can define if you want to, but you always, you don't have to, whatever is important for you. Maybe you don't capture costs in your project schedule. You don't have to enter that information here if you don't want to. The resource sheet is used when you are entering your resources for the first time or adding users here. Or you can come back here at any time to make adjustments if you need to to the information. If somebody's rate changes or their calendar changes and you need to make an update to that or to add new resources to your project, you'll come back to this view here to be able to do that. So entering the So entering in the max capacity for your work resources, this is where you can assign a max units for each of your resources. Max units represents the availability or capacity of a resource to work on the tasks assigned to them. Uh, when you specify by default, it, it will specify a resource has 100% max units. This means that 100% of their working time is available for tasks that you have. Um, uh, a lot of times that's not the case and your resources do not have unlimited capacity to work on projects. A lot of times they have to spend their time on another aspect or responsibility in the business, um, such as operational work, maintenance work, um, keep the lights on activities. Um, a lot of times I see IT department resources, they have to handle a ticketing system. So maybe they're only 50% available for project work. You can design here. Understanding the max units and being able to apply it to your schedule will, and it, it, it may be a trial and error, but it will, it will absolutely give you a much, much clearer, clearer uh, scope and vision for how your projects are going to run. It will give you a lot more realistic time frame for seeing this versus, versus saying everybody's 100% and you know that they're not. Project will alert you when a resource is over allocated. Uh, you'll see in the indicators column, uh, a little red man and it'll pop up and it'll say that your resource has more tasks assigned to them than they can accomplish in the time frame that you have set. So if your resource is available for eight hours a day and you scheduled them 16, it's going to alert you that that person is over allocated. So there may be times when you have not defined the a human, a one person, you have a role or a group and you need to be able to update your max units to reflect an accurate representation of that generic resource. So for example, if you have a team of testers, like we had in our previous example, and you have four people on your tester team, then, and those people are all 100% available, then you might wanna up the max units for your testers resource to be 400% or representing that four people are working 100% on your task. Uh, on the other hand, if you have people like in our IT example that are much less, then you need to lower the max units to show that they don't have as much time. Um, our example here at the bottom, talking about a group of people um, have, and it being over 100%, uh, for example, if you have 200%, it, it can be any combination that results in a 200% max unit, whether that means that two people are going to be working full time, four people working half time or like I mentioned, any combination of those that will get you that same, same math, <laughs> the same total of max units. So you can have different pay rates associated with your work resources as well. Setting up these pay rates will help you track and manage the cost of your project, both from the onset when you originally do it, and then as you go for your actual cost. You can enter pay rates in a a couple of different places. You can have either standard, you, you can identify a standard rate and an overtime rate for your resources. Um, or you can have a couple of different ways that you identify that. You can say they are $100 per hour or they are 50,000 per year. You can identify it. You may not wanna go as granular as minutes or hours, but you are able to do that if you'd like. And since most projects have a financial aspect associated with them, cost is usually involved in some 
some matter and it may limit the scope of the project or some other aspect but being able to track that in one places along with a lot one place along with your resources is um is absolutely recommended uh, so when you track your costs in here associated with your resource you can track and manage that information and it allows you as a project manager to understand what's the anticipated total cost of my project how much specifically is resource A costing me? How much specifically is this task or stage or phase of my project costing me? I mean, and, and is this is, is my spend rate sustainable? Do I need to change something up as my project progresses? The project calculates the cost of an assignment by multiplying the assigned work times the pay rate for that specific resource. Um, so we'll, we'll dive more into assignment planning in our next webinar, but Assignments are defined by the resources on a task. Um, it's not just a one-to-one. -one. If you have a task that has five different resources assigned to it, there are five assignments for that task. And each one can have its own calculation of the work for that resource times their own individual pay rate. Overtime pay is can be defined in project, um, but it will not, even if your resource is over allocated, it will not automatically apply an overtime rate to your project unless you specifically say these time or overtime hours. Um, there's too great of a chance that you might accidentally ap apply overtime when you didn't mean to, and that would affect the cost of your project plan. So project says, let's avoid that. If you have any overtime work, I need you to specifically tell me that so I can adjust my calculation. You can set the default standard rates and overtime rates for your resources in your project options on the back end. If you know most of your resources have a rate of $100 per hour, you can set that up in your project options to always have that be what your standard rate is. I personally have mine at zero, and then I can just go type it in as I need to. A resource can also include a set fee that applies to each task when a resource is assigned. And this is the cost per use. Um, for example, if every time you use a particular shuttle service, there's a fixed charge of $10, then you can enter a cost per use for that resource of $10. And so every time that's applied, you get a $10 charge in addition to any other fees associated with that resource. Another example is a storage fee. Um, if you are records management and you have a fee for, for delivering files, to you, you might have a fixed storage fee of $350. And any additional charges are on top of that, but you know at a minimum you're going to be charged $350 and it's only applied once to your project. And the cost per use, as I mentioned, it is a one time and so it doesn't vary with the task duration or work or any other aspects with your task. It is a one time per use uh, cost. On I believe it was our first webinar, we talked about calendars and the importance of defining those calendars in your project schedule so that you get the most accurate, most realistic vision of what your project schedule is going to look like. We identified several project level holidays. Um, in our last one, you can enter in some exceptions into your calendar. It's a change working time icon in your project ribbon. So at the project level, you can identify across the board, these days are non-working for my project. Even below that, you can have a different layer of calendars, and that's the resource calendar. The resource calendar controls the working and non-working time of a specific resource. So these are a per resource um, specific. So these do also, so the project calendar is kind of high on the, the highest on the hierarchy, and then the resource calendar is underneath that. So any project calendar, uh, holidays you have, such as Thanksgiving coming up, you do not need to apply that to your resource calendars as well. It will kind of, it will pull in from your schedule, project won't schedule any work for those any, anyways. But if they have any that differ from that project's uh, calendar, then you do need to update, update those here. Um, so there are those different calendar for different purposes. So when a resource is initially created, the resource calendar is created for the work resource using the working time standards to match your project calendar. By default, this is eight hours a day, five days a week, a typical 40 hour work week. But you may have to go in to adjust that accordingly. If you have somebody who maybe only works nine hours a day, Monday through Thursday, and then half day on Friday. If you have somebody that has a 980 day, or you have part time for only eight, eight to 12 every day, you can do that. 
Um, the other reason you might want to use resource calendars are to uh, put in that vacation time for your resources. Those would be any exceptions that, that you have identified for them. So in addition to updating their working time, you may also want to go and say, um, my resource is taking off the whole week of Thanksgiving, so I need to make sure I go and have and update the resource calendar so that project will not schedule any work for them during that time. So one example about the calendars and changing the default working time is about a part-time resource. If you have somebody that's going to work 40 hours, not 40 hours, four hours daily, then you can either enter a specific for their calendar to work eight to 12 daily. You can create a new calendar that shows eight to 12 daily, or you can update their max units to be 50%. So there are a couple of different ways you could you can update through that resource's working time. Uh, my preference, if it's a resource level, is to update specifically that resources calendar to show when their working times are, but you can do it um, in a couple of different places. As I mentioned, when it comes to the different calendars that are being applied to your project, the project calendar dates and exceptions are reflected automatically in your resource calendars. Uh, they, you might not see them exactly there, but they do have a relationship there where they're, they're there by default. It's not going to schedule time unless it's a working time for the project already. Now we're going to look at our project schedule, and we are going to add resources to our schedule here. So I am going to hide some of the columns that we were just looking at. I'm going to hide my deadline column here. I hid my constraints column. Let's add in our resource. So to add in resources to your project, it is from the resource sheet. So you can either go off here to the left and look at the name and right click and go to resource sheet or you can go to the resource ribbon, the view ribbon, and go to the resource sheet here. I'm going to click on it this way. So you can see I have nobody here by default in my project schedule. So I'm going to go ahead and add in a couple of resources. I'm going to add in a project manager. I'm going to add in Daniel Shackelford. I'm going to add in Amy Winston. We're going to add in a couple of, a couple of guys here so that when we move on to our Assignment planning next week, we have a couple of different resources to work with. Okay. So by doing that, you can see it gave a default across the board of max units of 100%. And my standard rate and overtime rate are both zero. So it did go ahead and do that for those guys. So once you have your resources entered here, you can update the max units. You can update it directly here. I can just come in here. It's the easiest way to update it. If you double click, you get a very specific resource information box. And so you can also update that here. You have the max units is right here specifically. So I'm going to update my max units accordingly. I'm going to have project managers 50%, architect, I have two architects in the project, so I'm going to do it 200%. Those are the only changes I'm going to make. I'm going to leave everybody else where they should be uh, for now. And I'm going to update some pay rates so we can look at our cost as we look to add them to our project. Project manager, 75 an hour, 100 for these guys, 50. So I am going to go ahead and give Barbara Simmons, my last resource here, an overtime rate of $150 an hour. I'm also going to give her a cost per use of $150. Let's see, what other changes do we want? So now we're going to look at our resource calendars. I am going to change specifically Barbara Simmons' working time. So I'm going to click on her here, I'm going to click on the project ribbon, and click change working time. So I know this is her calendar because up at the top in the for calendar, it tells me it's Barbara cal Barbara's calendar here. I can do a drop down and I can see I can update any of these calendars here. But for simplicity and to confirm you're in the right place, I usually just click share on there and click that change working time button. So I am going to see, so I see here in the exceptions, she doesn't have any exceptions right now. She doesn't have any specific holidays or vacation time coming up. I am going to go ahead and give her uh, a training. I'm going to say she's going to be in a technical training. And I am going to make it for next week, which starts on the 11th. So I'm going to say this is going to be from the 11th to, well, I'll say for most of next week. So she has a training next week that's going to take away from her availability in my project. 
I'll go ahead and click OK here. Let's see, what other changes can we make to our calendar here? I am going to update Amy. Click on her here. Make sure I'm still on the project ribbon. Click on change working time. And I am going to change her to have a different default work week. She's not an eight to eight to five, five days a week kind of a worker. So I'm going to click on my work weeks tab here. And then here is the default. This is what I'm going to use by default. So I'm going to click it and then click deta details. And I can see as I scroll through what product has defined for her working time. So I am going to update hers. I am going to say she is only working Monday through Thursday. So I can just hold down control and I can click all of those in one time to update them all at once since they're going to be the same. And then I'm going to say I want to set these days to specific working time. So this is where I can update. So I'm going to say she's 8 to 12 and then, excuse me, and then I'm going to say instead of from 1 to 5, she's going to work 1 to 7. Whoops, let's make sure that we are in the right morning or afternoon. So that's how I want to set her, her for those. And then, so for Friday, then that would make her non working on these days. So I'm going to click here, set, set this day to non working. Or if you set well, um, it to specific working times, you can go ahead and back out those, those hours if you'd like to. Go back through and just make sure, click it. I'm going to go ahead and click save. And then you can see it adjusts this little visual of her calendar up here as well to show you when her working and non-working times are. So on Fridays, across the board, she's non-working. In my project schedule that we originally defined in my project calendar, we did identify Thanksgiving as a day that's coming up. So you can see that that is inherited in her calendar here. Project says those are non-working, so hers are non-working as well. And so on, on these days, you can see over here what the working times are defined. Then go ahead and see. I can just click around, just confirm it's right, make sure you have everything where you want it to be. And so you can see here Thanksgiving Day is set for this on my standard project calendar. All right, so she is all set. I'm going to go ahead and click Save. So now that we have made some updates to our resource calendar, we are going to test Barbara's exception that we put in. We put in a technical training for her for next week. And so I'm going to flip back to my schedule. I'm going to go back to my Gantt chart. And I am going to assign her for one intentionally on the days that I know that she is not available for that. So I'm going to look at my secure core resources task right here. So I'm going to go ahead and you can see right now there is it's, it's tentatively it's going to start on November 11th and it's going to finish on November 15th. So I'm going to go ahead and assign Barbara here. I can use my drop down here or I can start to type in her name and it will auto, auto populate. I'm going to click, click enter. And you can see, since I did that, I have scheduled her to work on a day that is defined in her calendar as being not working. And so with that being the case, it's going to push out that work to her next available working day, which would be the 15th. Uh, we had her scheduled to be off at the 14th, so the 15th on Friday is the very next day that she is available for that work. I'm going to go to my resource usage view, which is a different way to view where your resources are scheduled to do work. You can see the tasks in a very time-phased manner. Over here, you have a chart. So I can see here, here's Barbara, and here is a task I have assigned her to. And so you can see over here, we have some white boxes. That means it's a, it's a regular working day. She doesn't have anything scheduled for these days, but it, it is a regular working day for her. So we can come over here when we get to the 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th, where we have scheduled her technical training to take place. And you can see that those boxes aren't nearly as white as these ones over here. They're a little gray to indicate that that is non-working time for this resource. And you can see up here for Amy as well, every Friday for her has that lighter, light shaded gray box that means she's not available. And so we can see on Friday, the 15th, which is where it pushed the workout to, that Barbara is scheduled to work eight hours on that day for this task. You can go, uh, and it's an eight hour task, so it's the only one we have, but it did push that out because of her exception in her calendar. So we're going to go, we're going to go back to our Gantt chart here. We're going to remove her from that. We're going to save that assignment planning fun for next week. We're going to go back to our resource sheet here, and we're going to go ahead and add in a material resource, some, uh, one that is uh, a material of some kind, a reams of paper, uh, pounds of concrete. You can tell those are my, my favorite examples. So you can type it straight in here if you would like. Um, if you do that, it's going to automatically give you a work cost type, which is not what we want. Uh, you can just manually change it here if you'd like. You can see a couple of the columns here. The information is removed, such as the max units, 
um, because they're not applicable here. This, this resource isn't going to have any work. I'm going to go ahead and delete that guy. Or the other way you can do it is you can have a resource here, add a resource, and add a material resource. Um, by default, it'll give you the new resource icon here. It'll give them the material resource uh, label, and then it'll populate any fields that it needs to be. So I'm going to go ahead and put comp back space comp concrete as my material resource here. I'm going to give it a standard rate of $10. And so the translation of this is that one unit of concrete, whatever I define, is going to cost $10 for me. I'm going to double click here. And you can see here it's material. And here is where I can put my label. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and just keep it, I don't know, pounds, pounds of concrete. Click OK. You can see that it's populated here. So this is a way for me to identify what it is. Project does not care what the material label is, but I might care. So here is where a place for you to reference what that cost is. It's going to cost me $10 per pound of concrete. So now I'm going to go ahead and add in my, my cost resource. I'm going to have that be on our very next line here. Let's scroll up. Again, you can go ahead and type in. You just are going to have to change that resource type, or you can go back up to your resource ribbon and click on Add Resources and click on Cost. You can see what fields it populates here. It only has the name and the cost type here, an initial and a, and a pro rate here. But all the other fields that have to do with this are irrelevant because when you assign this particular cost resource to a task, you assign the cost at that time. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to use my entry bar up here at the top. Uh, to backspace my new resource. I like the entry bar. I believe it's off by default, but there is a project option to turn that on. And I'm going to go ahead and rename this to be travel, which is by far the most popular cost resource that I have seen. I'm going to go ahead and add in my cost resource here. And instead of a cost resource, that's pretty much all you need to do. There's not any other information that you need to populate here in association with that. There's no availability or calendar or any other cost associated. Just really need to give it a name. So let's come back here. So we talked a little bit about cost and resources. So we don't need to go back to that. So we do have resource notes that you can associate with your resources. Um, those uh, are identified in the notes section. It's similar to the task information. There's a note section there as well. Um, since you do want to make both your task name and your resource name, I'm going to talk about them both here for a second. Since you want to make both of them clear, easy to read, not too long, pretty straightforward. You may still need to add some other information. If you need to add additional information about a task, your task can be defined project scope. But in your notes section, you can list off all the things you want to define. And then in the resource, you can do the same thing. You can give your resource a very clear name. And then in the notes section, you can define anything about that particular resource. Um, like maybe for now, this is their schedule, but they, have some, they may have something come up. They may have a conflict come up. Or there's an additional note about maybe how to handle them an email address, how to contact them. There's other ways that you other ways that you can put in that information into your project schedule here. We're going to come back to our resources over here. And there are a couple of different places that you can add to project. I'm sure you've noticed that's a theme by now. It gives you several different ways to do the same task, and it's up to you to pick your favorite one. So we are going to add in a note for Barbara. Oops. So we're going to double click on Barbara here. Uh, there is, when you double click, it will bring up your resource information box. You can click on notes you can type in any notes you have right here, and you'll get an indicator there that there is a note associated. You can also click on her and in your resources ribbon, click on information here. It'll bring you to that same exact box. Or you can be on the Gantt chart. Or you can do a split view here. Um, I am a big fan of the split views. They allow you to see more information at one time. You can see, you know, especially in the Gantt, you can see the whole project and you can see task specific. And then here I can see all of my resources and then I can scroll through and whichever one I have selected, it brings up specific information for that resource. If you right click here, you can see information for them. 
So if I click here for Barbara specifically, I can see her rates, her per use, her overtime. I can see it here as well, but here is where I can see any tasks she's assigned to when, once we assign her tasks. So I'm going to right click and choose notes, and I'm going to add in a note for Barbara. I'm going to say um, Barbara is a unique resource requiring a cost per use of $150. So once I click OK, you can see there's a note here by her. Um, it show it, if, you ha if you hover over it, it will show you exactly what it does say, so you don't have to you know, double click or anything like that. If you're just doing some easy navigation, you're like, hey, what's this note? You can just hover over it and see right here exactly what that is. So once we start adding our resources to tasks, and there's a little bit more information uh, for us to, to process here, I'm going to go to my resource usage view for just a second. I'm going to hide my split view. I can just right click and uncheck it, or I can uncheck it from my ribbon up here, either one. Um, there is several ways to view information about your resources here. Um, this here, we did talk about views and tables in a couple of um, in our uh, first webinar. And you can see that there are a couple of different tables here for viewing information. The one I am in is summary. So it's going to give me a summary of my resources which makes sense. So it gives me you know, all kinds of mix match information. It gives me information about their work, about their costs, about their rates, about their max units. But a lot of times what you want to do is you're focused or targeted on a very specific element at one time. So for example, I want to come in and I want to see the cost associated per resource. Here is where I can come see it. It's in my view ribbon up here. And then I have a table section and I can apply my cost view and I can see it right there. I can see Let's take, for example, my project manager resource. Uh, once, once they are added to top tasks and your product is in execution, you can come here and you can see what is my project manager costing me to do? What did I originally capture it as in my baseline? And then what is my variance? What is the difference between the two? I can look at my actual cost, my remaining cost based on what I originally anticipated. And I can see that broken out here in a time phase manner as well. You can add in your cost section here. And so you can see a lot of information at one time. And hide my cost here. And in a similar matter, if you want to look at specific work for your resources, you can enable your work table. And you can see here where it's at. You can see, let's see, I have unassigned. Oh, I have a lot of unassigned work, so I haven't assigned any yet. But you can see here by work, you know, what's the percent complete for their tasks? What work do they have? What did I originally anticipate, which is my baseline? What's the difference between the two, which is my variance? What is my actual? What have they actually done on my project? And what's the remaining? And you can, again, you can see it over here in a time phase. You can click on actual work so that you can compare. This is what they were planning to do today. Here's what they actually did today. You can go like that across all your resources if you'd like to. So that is the end of our webinar for today. It was just a review of um, a very, not just a review, a very in-depth look at our resource planning, the different kinds, the different information that's uh, important to keep in, uh, up to date or active for your resources, any important data points that you need to see there. There's a couple of best, best practices about resource planning in your project schedule. So we do have a couple of, uh, we do have more upcoming webinars to finish out our product essentials series. We are skipping next week, and our next webinar is the following week, and it has to do with assignment planning with Microsoft Project. In this, we will do several what-if scenarios. We are going to add resources to a task. What happens if I add one resource? What happens if I then need to add another? And we're going to go through a couple of different things like that in relation to a lot of the tasks settings that you already set up. The, the task type, is it a fixed duration task or a fixed work task? So we're gonna do, we'll do a brief review of those before we jump into assignment planning. But if you really, really want that in-depth of those, then we have the it's a task planning part two. Our very last webinar was posted, I believe, as of Monday. So you can go take a look. And then after the Thanksgiving holiday, we are going to look at product execution. And then the following week, project reporting. And then the following week, we're going to look at custom fields. There's some other options to help you navigate around in your project client. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. My email address is right there at the bottom. Um, and you can also get to our website to register for these courses to get more information or to view previous webinars that we have done. So I appreciate you all for joining uh, and have a good day.